It was election day on November 3, 1998, in Jacksonville, Florida, and citizens across the nation lined up at the polls. In the meantime, Josh Phillips was busy murdering Maddie Clifton and thinking of the right place to hide her body, before his parents returned home. He eventually shoved her body under his bed, sleeping on top of her for a week until his mother found her. Maddie Clifton was an eight-year-old girl watching television when the adults were still at work at the polls. The little girl then decided to go for some basketball with her older sister, Jessie and went on to play with other neighborhood kids. At around 6 p.m., her mother called the girls in for dinner. Jessie returned, but Maddie did not. Jessie told her mother he hadn't seen her younger sister and didn't know where she was. In no time, Sheila Clifton called 911 to report a missing person. Her. While the whole nation watched, an entire town sprung into action. Eight-year-old Maddie had mysteriously vanished from her home in Jacksonville, Florida, on the election date. Hundreds of people joined search teams, camera crews came to the suburbs, and two parents tried to hold up. Steve and Missy Phillips, and their son Josh, were there as well. A search party of 400 local volunteers, searched for the girl for several days. Flyers were scattered throughout Jacksonville, and Maddie Clifton's face will soon cover every screen. There was a $500,000 reward, and soon it doubled. The investigation determined, that Maddie was likely abducted by a family member or friend. One of their neighbors stood out, a man facing multiple sexual assault charges who had been released over a decade earlier. The disappearance of Maddie led to the suspect failing a lie detector test, and he provided an alibi. Then, on the seventh day, the search for Maddie Clifton abruptly ended. Because Yoshi's mother found Maddie in her son's room across the street from Maddie Clifton's home. On the morning of November 10, 1998, Josh and his father left the house, leaving his mom with a messy house to clean. The mess in her boy's room made her shake her head. Then she noticed a wet spot on the floor at the corner of Yosh's soft-sided waterbed and said, this bed is leaking. She touched the corner of the mattress, and it was soaked. Instead of cleaning, she investigated the leak. When she lifted the corner of the mattress, she noticed a white sock and thought it was Yosh's. She tried to pull on it, but it would not budge. At that time, she noticed black electrical tape holding the pedestal together and surmised it must have been leaking for quite some time. And apparently, Josh was holding it together with the tape so as not to get in trouble. Just enough of the tape was separated from the pedestal in the wood that she could see the sock. The pedestal was slightly off, so the stock fell down. It couldn't be what she thought. But she knew exactly what it was. It was the missing child across the street. First thing, she called her husband at work, but he wasn't at his desk and she could only leave a frantic message on his voicemail asking him to call her right away. Then she had to contact authorities, and all she had to do was cross the street, to get one officer. She just walks out her front door and gets an officer to come back with her. They had been there for a week. As she walked across her driveway, she nearly implicated her son in this horrifying discovery. Backslash on the way back to her house, she saw police erecting crime scene tape around the residence. Josh was in his geography class at school when he was called to the office, met by two detectives and taken into custody. At the police station, the 14-year-old son met his parents. Having his father by his side, Josh confessed and described the day that the 8-year-old's body was killed. Josh said Maddie came over to his house and wanted to play. He told her that his father told him he couldn't go out and play when they were not at home, but she insisted. He then agreed only to play for a few minutes since dad would be getting home soon and he would be upset. Josh said he and Maddie played baseball in the backyard around 5.15 pm. Maddie threw the ball to Josh, and when he had it back to her. It struck her in the head, and her head was gashed. Then, she started to cry and scream. Josh knew his parents would be home soon, and he feared they would punish him for that. Then he strangled Muddy for 15 minutes with a phone cord on the other side of the house. When she kept making noises, he became even more terrified. 
In an attempt to silence her, Josh hit her with his baseball bat and stabbed her twice in the throat with his pocket knife. And now she was silent when his parents got back home. Josh behaved normally, but he returned to his bedroom when he heard Maddie moaning. Wanting to finish the job and eliminate any noise, he stabbed her twice in the neck and nine times in the chest when he found out she was still alive. Josh was arrested for the murder of Maddie Clifton. While grieving for their daughter, Josh's parents tried to figure out what possessed their 14-year-old son to commit such a heinous act. To everyone who knew him, Josh seemed like a completely normal kid. In the end, that normal kid sat in an isolation cell at a pre-trial detention facility for nearly nine months. He would be charged as an adult, but the media made it virtually impossible for Josh to get a fair trial. In July of 1999, Josh's trial began, and the evidence against him was overwhelming. The baseball bat, pocket knife, and Josh's own admission. On top of that, Josh's story did not match the physical evidence, there was no blood on the baseball. When Maddie's body was found beneath Josh's bed, and though her body showed no signs of rape, the prosecution suggested that the murder may have been sexual in origin. The trial lasted only two days, and in the afternoon of Wednesday, July 8, 1999, after two hours of liberation, the jury returned with their verdict. Joshua Patrick Phillips was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Maddie Clifton, an eight-year-old girl. If he had been 16 years old, he would have been eligible for the death penalty. The crime committed by the defendant is indeed an uncommon case, it qualifies for a life sentence. On the 17th of December 2019, this sentence of life in prison was upheld by Florida's First District Court of Appeals. Joshua Phillips is currently serving his sentence at the Cross City Correctional Institution. During these past few days, I've sat here and I'm in this courtroom and I have listened to all of the classes that the defendant has been able to take. What classes has Maddie been able to take over the past 18 years? I didn't walk her down the aisle at her wedding and we were not given the gift of her grandchildren, all taken by one evil, senseless act, and we don't know why. This is for um, the family of Maddie Clifton. I've wanted to say this for a very long time, and uh, I'm grateful that this chance to do so in person uh, has arrived. Uh, I don't pretend to know or understand your pain or to grasp the void that I have created in your lives. I can say this, I do understand pain. I have become quite intimate with suffering. Growing up in prison, I have seen many dark things and I've been to some dark places. Many times throughout this journey, I came directly close to ending my life just to escape it all. During these times, I was embroiled in a flurry of emotions and feelings. Guilt, despair, pain, hopelessness, fear, and shame. Each time, I was somehow able to continue on, mostly because I couldn't stand to put my mother through any more trauma. She's been through enough. There were times that I was angry at her because I couldn't end my pain because of her love. Yet now, I'm eternally grateful to her. I'm grateful to her because as I've grown up, I have learned the value of life. I've learned to see the beauty and joy in a world full of strife and experience the truth of unconditional love. I wish to God that I could have known this or understood it when I was 14. Had I then, none of this would have come about. I had no clue what life meant, what death meant, nor the depths of suffering that could follow one act. I had no inkling of how long that suffering could last 
I hadn't lived long enough to understand the time involved or what really suffering was. I did something horrible. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what happened. Even now, after all these years, it is just unfathomable that all this could have occurred. It tears my mind asunder to know that I stole such a precious life from you, from the world. I so wish I could take away your pain. I thank God that I've been able to continue on in life and grow. But not a day goes by that I don't think of what led me to where I'm at. Not in prison, but in life. I pray every day that you're able to live your lives in spite of the injury I've caused you. I'm supremely grateful to have an opportunity at physical freedom. Yet any joy that arises in my heart is immediately tempered by the knowledge that these proceedings bring all involved once again, face to face with the horror that occurred in 1998. When I walked the rec yard here in chains, I looked at the sky through mesh wiring, and I thank God repeatedly for giving me hope. My next breath is always devoted to wishing peace and healing upon you all. My hopes, fears, and wishes probably mean nothing to you, but they are there all the same. May you know peace, may you be free from suffering, and may you feel the love that is the sustenance of life itself. May God bless you and heal your wounds as much as possible. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you so much for watching.